I'm Fred McMurray. It's 2 p.m. Pacific, which means this must be... Friday Eve. Happy Friday Eve and welcome everybody to Pillars of Franchising. Yet another week and another great guest. Here we go. Hey, let's talk about word on the street this week. Okay, let's do. And before we do, I'm going to read out the call-in number because we may talk about some things that you want to call us about. Um, so if you want to call into the show, it's 323-580-5755. Uh, feel free to pick up the line and ask questions of our guests or any of our mentors. Um, but we had a very exciting night last night. We um, offered a webinar to a professional sports group. Yes, um, we did. Yeah, uh, to tell them a little bit about franchising and why, you know, people in sports do well in franchising and um, why women do well in franchising. And introduced everybody to the team and got some really great feedback. How do you think it went? I think it went really well. I mean, uh, the thing is, it's almost impossible to get all of us together because we are literally scattered across the United States. And it's even harder to get a lot of groups of people together who have similar interests and they're from similar backgrounds. And in this case, from um, similar organizations, they're all from different teams uh, across the states. And so what a great way to do it, but through a, a live webinar. So kind of like we're coming to you today, live from all other areas of the country. Uh, we had one last night and literally had people from all over and got to talk a lot about kind of the reason that people look to franchising over starting their own business and really starting as Ray and I always talk about with the end in mind and, and uh, kind of your long game, if you will, kind of a play on the book. Uh, where do you see yourself? And I think that's a question a lot of people don't think about. If you look right now, and envision in the next 10 to 15 years, where do you really want to be? I think that always begs to, to the question, I guess, how are you going to get there? Because a lot of times the answer isn't just the daily nine to five grind working for somebody else. So we explored a lot of those options last night. And certainly that's what all of us here on the show uh, work with individuals on how to get to that exact answer every individual has a different path and that's what we're here for. So I think it went really well last night. It did. I mean, about that. It's never too soon to plan, even if you're not quite ready to make that leap or, you know, you need to get your finances in a little bit of order or you've got to finish up another job or whatever it is. Um, never too early to start understanding what it takes to get there so that you're prepared whenever you are ready to make that decision. Um, no, we, know, Go ahead. we know that if, People are looking to buy into a franchise I mean it could move as quickly as three months but it could take as long as a year and in some cases if you're dealing like in these weird times we have now it could go even up to 18 months if you're dealing with build outs and you're dealing with um, specialty skilled workers um, you know those are some of the uh, kind of the curveballs that you get that we didn't used to have to worry about. So I think it's really important for people to understand that just because you are thinking about it today, it doesn't mean that you're under this time crunch that in your, your whole world is going to change in three months. And it also doesn't mean that um, it's going to take you two years to, to make it happen either. So uh, the course is certainly set a lot uh, in terms of time up to you and the team that you work with to get it done. Absolutely. So, um, as you know, <laughs> we are doing a lot of events that speak to a lot of different groups of people. So if you haven't looked at our calendar, the magazine for April is coming out tomorrow yep. with cover girl Ruth Agbaji of Code Wiz. She gives a great interview and talks a ton about the emotional ups and downs of owning a business. And she was just acquired uh, mm -hmm. last year. So she, she talks about the transition curve and all the tools that she's been using to navigate you know, the, the blind optimism and then the informed <laughs> pessimism and then, you know, 
all yeah. of the things that you go through. And it was a really, I think it's a really helpful perspective. She was very open and honest about it. Um, but, but when you look at that magazine tomorrow, check the calendar because the first Wednesday of every month, we have a networking uh, meeting with the, the Pillars team, whoever can come, um, where you can learn and ask questions about franchising. We are not doing April because Jerry and I are going to the Titus Center board meeting um, on Monday through Wednesday. Yep. So we will not do it for April, but starting back up in May, we're going to do that networking event. Um, it's at 530 Central Time on Wednesdays. Yep. We also do lunch and learns once a month. They're the third Friday of the month at noon central time. We have yep. Laura yep. Liss, who's our franchise attorney. And tell everybody, Kristen, what um, she will talk about. She's going to give a broad, broad strokes of legal things and franchising. But what does that mean yeah. to people? Well, I mean, some of the things that Laura talks about, um, and, and I think it's important to, to kind of disseminate between the two different meetings as well, because you know, one is more aimed at so you so you own a franchise now what, right? And, and right. that's more for people who, and not that people who don't own franchises can't attend because there's a lot to be gained. Um, but our hope is to keep it a little more like I'm here and now I'm not quite sure what to do. I've kind of tapped my franchisor for all the information they can provide, and now I need a little bit more than what they can provide me. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one is really like you're in the exploration. Like, I think I want to get into business for myself. I want to exit corporate America. You know, where do I go next? And so, you know, those are two different types. Um, as it comes to Laura List with Fran Law, um, there's a lot of things that franchise lawyers do that regular lawyers don't. And when we are working with a client on buying a franchise, it's very important that you get a franchise lawyer. We will tell you that again and again. And that's because they help you work through the god awful franchise disclosure document that can be anywhere from 250 pages to 600 pages. And that's the good, the bad, the ugly, the Bible, the franchise that you're about to buy or that you're reviewing. Uh, it has everything from financials to using the, the logos and all kinds of other fun stuff. Um, Laura can help you review your leases. Um, in the case of one franchisee that we're working with right now, uh, she's leasing a space that is about to undergo a major reconstruction and refacing, which is going to negatively impact her traffic flow, not only for the building, but her markings of the building, everything from people being able to get in there, traffic being able to get past it, her signs being able to go up, now the code or what her signs need to look like is going to change. So all of those are kinds of things that you want somebody who is skilled at not only franchise law, but also understands leases and things of that nature to set aside really satisfy the franchisor and the landlord at the same time. Yeah. Um, and that's just a tip of the iceberg of the things that she's going to go over. Yeah. Um, so it, it's so one you don't really want to miss if you're in, if you're no. a new franchisee, um, she'll have, and you can ask questions. So that's, that's yeah. the most important part. If we're not right on the topic, you need to know right that minute, you can Absolutely. raise your hand and ask a question. Yes. And if you're a small business who thinks that, you know what, the thing I want to do is I want to take my model and I want to replicate it. I want to build my future by turning my business into a franchise. Well, she does that too. She can mm -hmm. help you turn your business into a franchise. So uh, another uh, audience perhaps to uh, be interested in this. Yeah. So if you're interested in that, take a look at the magazine tomorrow. It's in the front section of the magazine. Also, you can email us at your dream at pillars of and I will point you in the direction of the registration links. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think we are ready for our amazing guest. Kristen, let him let everybody know who he is. <laughs> oh my goodness, my dear friend. And I can't see the screen, so y'all have to help me. I'm flying a little bit blonde, but I'm hoping that the man I'm sitting by on the virtual screen here has glasses and dark hair. Is he a tall, dark, and handsome man? Is that what I'm sitting by, Ray? No one's talking. Oh, 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 oh Ray, you're <laughs> muted. Oh, oh no. John That's Cohen, it. is that you from Franworth? Dear God, man. Come off the mute. You know better. Our guest has to tell you that? Seriously. We, we, we were just talking about we need a little bit more reality in the show. The dogs were barking, so I put it on mute. 
<laughs> but then the dog stopped barking, so I forgot to take it off. I'm sorry. And Welcome, John. I queued <laughs> him up as tall, dark, and handsome, and <laughs> you let it sit there. Yeah. James, John. Mr. From Flush to Plush, John Cohen from Franworth, as Ray and I know him as the master of Molly Maid, right? Mm -hmm. um, Ray, I'm going to let you take us through his bio, but John, I'm so excited to finally have you here on the show with us. Oh, I'm yeah. excited to be here, guys. Yeah, absolutely. So, John, when did you start franchising? And, uh, you know, with, I assume that was with Molly Maid, is that correct? Well, um, actually, the story goes, I, I started my first career in McDonald's oh, um, okay. for a franchisee, working for a franchisee. And mm -hmm. worked my way up to a store manager, then got into Molly Maid. Okay. Yeah. But Ray, I don't really want to date myself, but I could because I think I'm the elder person in this room when it comes to uh, Molly Maid. So yeah, it's yeah. 1997. It was 25 years this month. Oh, wow. Wow. Oh. Okay. Well, when you said the elder in the room, I was going to say, well, that's not possible. But then when no. you want to put it on the Molly Maid time frame, okay, you win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But not well, by much. That, well, I've been in business for 18 years. So that means if you're 25, you were working for Molly Maid for what, seven years before I started. And so, but anyway, still 18 years is a long time to know anybody in this yep. day and age. And it's been a real pleasure to know you. <laughs> Same to you, Ray. <laughs> so let's, let's talk a little bit about that journey, John, because when, when we all started, I think you were actually doing some, um, some action committee stuff. Were you not? Or were you on the marketing committee? You were doing something already involved in helping lead the franchisees and working with, I'll call it the mothership, the franchisor. I was on the Franchise Advisory Council. Yeah, okay. you are 100% correct and, and enjoyed my time on there. Uh, six years in total. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so, and then I remember you, so, so you are, have always kind of been a leader. And obviously when you started at McDonald's, you shared with me, you were like 16 mm -hmm. and then you obviously started the leadership role in your life very early. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll credit your parents with that, that you were uh, brought up as a leader. Is that pretty accurate? It is. <laughs> I, I, I will let <laughs> them know your feelings there. I'm sure they'll <laughs> appreciate that. Well, I met your dad once, and so I just will automatically kind of think of him and imagine that that was his job to create that in you. But, um, and then, you know, it seems like you, your, your leadership there then took you into even further leadership. I remember you leading a group um, in SOAR. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that for Molly Made, what you did for the other owners? Yeah, so in my, my journey into the franchise or side of things started with something called SOAR, which was scale, optimize, apply, and rise. Um, Meg Roberts, who you had on the show before, yep. asked if I could help. I, I'm local here in Ann Arbor. Headquarters of Molly Maid used to be in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. And said, hey, we've been working together for, um, I believe it was seven years at the time already. Why yep. don't you come on and, and help owners and really scale their businesses in Molly Maid? And yep. um, we had an, uh, four groups of eight owners per group, and we took them through a program called SOAR and really helped them grow their business through four function areas. One is owner functions. We started mm -hmm. um, with that and building a foundation. We took them through a marketing um, session, selling, mm -hmm. a sales training, and how to use our sales systems properly. And then profit and loss. So right. by taking all those things and building a good foundation for their business, we were able to help them soar. Right. Yes, I forget what my flock was called. I was oh, in a flock. You, you can <laughs> never remember the flock. I know. Each group got to name their own bird. Yeah. There were some pretty interesting bird names out there. Yeah, I'm going to have to look that up. As long as I wasn't the Canadian goose, I was happy because those things <laughs> irritate me. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, that, and I bring SOAR up specifically because we talk about in Pillars, um, our mentorship program and being able to provide more than what the typical franchisor provides. And I found it so interesting and so helpful 
in our system, when you joined and the team came up with SOAR, because that really was something above and beyond what a lot of franchisors do, right? And like you said, the goal then was to help everybody scale up. Like, how do we make the next move? How do we get to the next level? Yeah, and that was really what SOAR was about. So quick story here. Um, I, I shared Meg Roberts. She was the president of Molly Maid at the time. Um, we went to a bar and grill uh, here in Ann Arbor by the U of M Hospital. It's mm -hmm. it's pretty famous and it's been here for a long time. Best burger in Ann Arbor. And this was all devised on a napkin. It's one of those <laughs> napkin stories. Sounds like pillars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It really was. We wrote everything down on a napkin and said, this is what we would like it to be. Mm -hmm. And um, you're right. It's something that I've enjoyed my whole career is mentoring business owners, helping yep. business owners succeed. Really uh, beyond that, though, is building the team that helps yep. the business owners succeed. And, and that's where some of the leadership pieces come in. But yes, I'm on the franchisor side today. I still have my franchise. That's why I said 25 years owning yeah. my Molly business. So I get to see both sides of it on a consistent basis. I get to hear the tears and the crying and the joys and the and the cheers. And it's a and lot of fun. And you feel them. And you feel oh. them still, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. My, my day doesn't go um, um, unfinished if I haven't done something for my Molly business and I, if I haven't done something in my day job as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's one of the things that made John so successful is I remember him visiting me when we opened our second, uh, our next location, bigger location. And that was one of the things he was able to empathize with because he had both, he was on both sides. And I thought that was really fantastic, John. And thanks for visiting us. <laughs> I loved it. Yeah. I still remember it, Ray. Yeah. I haven't forgotten. Weren't, weren't you next to a church? Uh, no, we Initially. were. Uh, no, oh, that was the old location. Initially, the new location yeah. was in a, in a, in a four-story building. But uh, Oh, yes, that's right. I actually, so I've been to both. You're right. I've been yeah. to both of yours. Yeah. Yep. yep. The four-story location was out outside the outskirts of a, of a mall. That's yes. right. Exactly. Yep. yep. And it, it's a prime location. And one of the things that uh, I try to uh, get across our, some, some of our people who are listening is location means something because uh, if you can have a location in a warehouse, you, your employees coming to work aren't as happy as coming to a, a, a class A location. So it, it makes a big difference in, in how they feel about coming to work. So John, tell us about the, the big transition. Obviously, you know, we don't, we don't want to sing the Molly Maid song too long, but um, you obviously were really great at developing some really strong relationships, and we saw a lot of change happen. Um, Meg left, went to Lash Lounge, part of Fran work, and then next thing we know, uh, you joined into Lash Lounge, which, what a big difference, going from cleaning toilets, where we got the title, the flush, into flush, where now you're involved in a lot of flush brands, right? You went to Lash Lounge, and now you're with Fran Worth itself doing other brands, right? Yeah, so um, my, my journey, I wound up following Meg over to Franworth after a period of time. Um, mm -hmm. She had, she didn't play a, a major role in that. They, they'd heard my name here uh, as well and said, hey, we, we've got some work. We want, we're building brands. So what Franworth is, is we partner with franchisors on who are, are usually small in scale who mm -hmm. want to grow. And right. we wind up partnering with them and helping them build systems, help them fill in certain departments like real estate and construction, um, KPIs with a Power BI dashboard, uh -huh. onboarding franchisees, franchise development. So we do a lot of things, help them build their operations team and what that looks like. Right. So we, we joined. Um, Franworth was also a, sort of a baby and we were building in some talent. Meg joined Lash Lounge. And um, before I get too much into Lash Lounge, I actually want to share a quick story with you guys. So your guest last week was Leanne <laughs> Tui, correct? Yes, she was. Yeah. She was, she's fabulous. I mean, who doesn't enjoy the blind side? I mean, That's what right. a fantastic story. Well, um, you, you, she's, 
she her husband and his brother own a bunch of franchises they've owned it together and then separate well his girlfriend of many years the the brother's the brother. girlfriend yep. yes mm -hmm. actually became one of molly or uh, lash lounge franchisees our franchise uh -huh. developer julia berman took her through um all the way through discovery day got her sold in memphis tennessee leanne wow. too, was actually there for the opening and um her name in case anybody's in memphis tennessee her name's dallas embry fantastic business has really awesome. just been a rock star i look at I there it. we got I, the, the six degrees of separation of Lu of leanne tui yes yes <laughs> i i when, when i when i watched your show last week and i saw her on i thought this was a perfect segue so, oh, that's oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. so i joined franworth and what we really needed to see is we had sold and started opening a ton of lash lounges and what we needed to do is really build the systems to make franchisees successful. It's what a good franchisor would do. Meg said, hey, why don't you join me here? And we do this together and we build this great system. And mm -hmm. I am so happy with what we've done in Lash Lounge. We have 116, it might be 118 today, open locations throughout the United States. And awesome. it has done so well. Um, wow. When you look at the beauty industry and you think of COVID and how hard they were hit, yeah, you know, you're doing you, a service. Uh huh. We just had I don't know if you saw our digital um, magazine, but we just had Michael. Is it Jania? Is that how you say his last name? Um, here in Chicago, we did a story on him because he was, oh my goodness, he was hit hard with, between COVID and the looting. His store downtown Chicago was just. Oh my goodness, the man had such a hard time and he has rebounded and he is back on top again. So I'll tell his story a little bit because this is the success story of Lash Lounge and he is the epitome of it. <laughs> so Michael Jania was already a franchise, a franchisee with Lash Lounge. And we had a location where, and, and sometimes it happens where someone realizes this business isn't for them. Right. great location in river north downtown chicago and what happened was the the owner needed to get out he, he said john i need to find someone to buy this business so i i met michael had some good talks with michael thought you know what we already have this location that's built you talked about it earlier when, when you're building a brick and mortar how long it can take he'd been looking at locations in the um, Chicago land area. And I said, Michael, I have this opportunity for you. You should okay. look at it. I said, okay, John, I trust you. I believe you. They made a deal. He bought the business, came to training end of January, 2020. <laughs> and you can imagine sometimes if, if a business owner isn't good at their craft, it, there may be a culture problem within the business. There was. Right and he was trying to rebuild that culture then march 16th happened and we started shutting down locations throughout the u.s oh my gosh one state at a time you know might be five states one day and the next day it's 10 states every yep. day it's more states shutting down to so the whole u.s shut down. well he was one of those obviously um in yep. illinois so he shuts down and he's one of the longer ones before he can reopen Oh, it's June. I can reopen. It's, and um, he realized his staff isn't coming back mm -hmm. because he didn't have time to rebuild that culture. So part of what we do at Lash Lounge is we help train estheticians on how to do lashing. So we we went ahead and did that, and we scheduled a time to come out. And he's got all his employees there. Sunday comes. We we start training on Monday. Sunday comes and there's the rioting that's happening in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Our corporate trainer is in a hotel mm -hmm. a block away, right on the same street. And um, I get this frantic phone call saying, I don't know what to do. There's rioting going on beneath me. Uh -oh. So make the call. We got to get her out. It's, it's yep. not, it just, we don't know what's going to happen. And yeah. we got to protect our employees. And Michael's actually in Texas, dropping his daughter off at, at college and flying back. 
And we have to tell him, we got to move this. We don't know what's happened. Well, he then shares with me his location had been looted. And hey, Ray, I've got real life too. I've got this automatic timer that keeps going off. So let me just turn my light back on. And um, <laughs> Michael uses, <laughs> it can't see me, this sensor. Um, so what happened was Michael um, said, I'm going to use this as a team building exercise. We're going to get the salon back up and running. We're going to order our, the supplies we need because everything was taken. Lashes, water, oh. cash. What do people do with that stuff? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we, we don't know. We've made some jokes about it, but we don't know. Um, oh, but my. he had a video. So he sent me the video and I, I see everyone piling up bins and just shoving everything and they have no probably have no idea what to use it for but who knows yeah. mm -hmm. um um but michael being the trooper he is i'm uses as a team building exercise puts up barriers on the outside wood barriers i'm sure it's in the magazine the picture mm -hmm. and he has an artist on staff and she, i want to paint this and let's do it all together and they paint this nice fabulous lash lounge um sign outside and then the next week we come back, we train his estheticians. So he's starting from scratch. Here is the cool part of the story. This was June of 2020. We call our top franchisee every month, queen, because they've all been women. And being yep. a male, hey, I'm, I'm all for that. I was the yep. only male on the Lash Lounge team and I loved every moment of that. <laughs> I have four daughters myself and I raised them to be strong females. But I had always said, I wanna hear about a Lash Lounge King. At some yep. point, there's going to be somebody for the month who's going to be a male. Yep. And last month, he was the Lash Lounge King. Awesome. So by February of 2022, he took that location that he bought in January of 2020, and he was the top franchisees in sales. And you no, know, yeah. we have one more day this month, but I looked, he's mm -hmm. going to do it again. And not only is he going to do it again, but he's going to set the record for what a top location has done. So when you talk about that story, and I hope everyone reads that about it, Yep. It's just a fabulous success story of what one person can do by breeding a culture of yep. inclusivity, of breeding a culture of inspiring his employees and his guests that come in. Yeah. Michael yep. is not above doing anything. He's a yep. chauffeur. Since he's in River North, sometimes he's got to go park the cars for the guests because they're running late. And he oh, will yeah. go and do that. Wow. Well, I got chills. Now I feel like I got to go get my lashes done. You do, because you're in the <laughs> Chicagoland area. I and am. Absolutely do. And you can take Ray because a male can get a tint and it'll make his brows and lashes. Ray! <laughs> oh my God, Ray, we're going to have a date and I'm going to go <laughs> okay. and you're going to go. Yes, I okay. knew it. We, we're going to take that gray right out of your brows, Ray. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> As a child, I remember my relative saying, oh, he has the most lovely lashes. <laughs> Obviously, I don't now, but. <laughs> well, we can make that all right by you. Yeah. Ray, you just yeah. get, a tent yeah. and it, get a tent and it's done. Yeah. You'll have your lovely yeah. lashes back. Yeah, yeah. So, John, I know, John, we're running out of time, but I have to, I, that was such a great story. Tell us quickly, Fran Worth has how many brands now? Because every time I seem like I look up Fran Worth, there's yet another brand that you have yeah. acquired. And are helping grow. Tell us really quickly about Tell us that. About it. So yeah, we have ten brands. We have different verticals that we that we work with. Um, right. We have the beauty, which is um, Lash Lounge, and then mm -hmm. we have a facial company, um, which is called Scoa Facial Shop. It's yep. fantastic if you want to get a facial done. It's all products that we do in house. Um, so it, it's it's fantastic as well. We, we are looking to add a few other beauty brands in the future. Okay. Um, we, we also have fitness with the barcode and city row. Yep. We have service-based businesses like Garage Kings for epoxy mm -hmm. flooring. That's Very how you cool. know it. It's, re it's really epoxy 2.0. I want to say that even 
though um, it, there's a more technical name to it. It's not the epoxy flooring of the past where you drop something on the floor and it cracks or gets wet and you slip and fall. This oh is my more... God, I have that one. <laughs> <laughs> I did too. And, and yeah. my first winter, luckily I was younger at the time. I slipped and fell. said, oh, I'm never going to do this again. But I got yep. sold on this second one. It's flexible. It's got the tactile um, texture to it so you don't slip and fall and it does a great job of keeping your garage floor clean we also have a, a brand called homesteady which is a handyman service mm -hmm. um, it is going to be the first handyman service nationally that's going to offer membership oh. you get a discounted price that's interesting yeah. and you bank hours and when you're ready for them to come you can make a honeydew list <laughs> and they yes yes i love this concept Perfect. we also do something called franchising for good which we we have a build strong academy which is a nonprofit organization where mm -hmm. we're assisting in training for free trades mm. it is awesome. fabulous. the goal of the build strong academy is to touch a million lives and that's what we're going to do. That's just a small sample size of what Fran Worth is. And all of these brands, except for Lash Lounge, has yep. well under 100 locations. So our awesome. job and what we work to do is grow these businesses to above 100. You just moved Kristen away. I yeah, know. I got blown <laughs> away. I see that. I was like, oh my gosh, there I went. I got to come <laughs> back now. I can see you, but you can't see me, but I'll figure this out, not to worry. <laughs> I'll be back. I can hear you all. I'm just on the down low right now. So John, I, you know, the one thing I really want to do is make sure, I, I think it was Josh uh, that came on and talked to us about, um, about just that, talking about um, the giving back franchising for good. And um, I would love to have him come back on to tell us some more about that, because it sounds like this training um, for the trades has really grown since we've seen him last. Um, tell us, how do we get in touch with you, with Fran Worth? How do we go if, if people want to learn more about it? Obviously, they can call us if they want to talk about franchise opportunities. But if they want to talk a little more in depth, how do they go about that? Okay, so um, two ways. And the easiest way that I think is you should go to franworth.com. We have a beautiful website with a great videos explaining what we do, how we help franchisors, which ultimately helps franchisees because we're in franchising for franchisees. Everything right. is about helping franchisees succeed because if you want to be a successful franchisor, you have to do it at the local level. That's how you grow your business. But my recommendation is go to uh, franworth.com, check out our website. There's contact us form on there. There's our whole team bio. You can see everyone who's on the team in the background. One of the great things about Franworth is combined, we have over 500 years of franchising experience. Awesome. It isn't just me where I shared and I'm not going to, you, you know, I'm an owner for 25 years, but I wasn't going to share how long I go back to uh, McDonald's, but all sure. together, we're over 500 years of franchising. That's wow. amazing. That's amazing. Well, listen, you look great. I think franchising has been very good to you. And obviously Fran Worth has kept that, that, um, that flame alive in your soul. And so I'm really happy to see that. And I know that not only will you do great things uh, with Fran Worth, but so will the whole team that, that you guys have with you over there. So thank you so much for taking time with us. And you know, we'll stalk you until we get you back on the show again to talk more about the individual brands. I would love to, Kristen. <laughs> All right. You still owe me a cocktail, just so you know. I owe you a cocktail. And I think Thanks, I probably John. owe Ray a cocktail too. Now. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you guys. It's a pleasure to see you. Hey, franchise owners. How's your local marketing? Do you feel like you could use some help keeping up with your social media posts and comments and reviews? Do you wonder if you could be doing more to attract local customers? Are you able to identify new movements to your local area? At Westvine, we help franchisees like you reach more local customers through digital marketing. With daily monitoring, creative content, and ad placement, and customer data intelligence, we'll get your business in front of the people who want your products or services. 
We also work with franchisors who need an agency to handle the digital marketing for all of their locations. If you're ready to reach more local customers, give us a call at 805-265-5440 or visit us at westvine.com. That's 805-265-5440 or westvine with a y.com. <laughs> Well, I think that's supposed to be Elizabeth. <laughs> and it's, it's probably all my fault because I got this uh, this OBS Ninja thing all goofed up. <laughs> or it's supposed to be Jerry. Well, nonetheless, Jerry, there's Jerry. Jerry. Is. Oh, oh Jerry. it was the side of his car. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'm glad we know who's supposed to be talking. About yeah, sorry, Jerry. You're gonna have to. You're you're really I talking. It was, I I can talk to anybody, Kristen. I don't have any issues with that. Um, I thought it was phenomenal listening to John. That was a great message, and he's. Uh, I love what Franworth is doing. It's. I want to do more research on Franworth now. Yeah, it's really a great a great company. And Josh Titler, who's at the helm, he's a great individual as well. I'm glad to see that he's got uh, John as his co co pilot. So, uh, yeah. lots of great things to watch. I'm well, sorry, Chris, Kyle, I'm... not not Josh. I, I, Josh, don't let that go to your head now. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen, I'm going to deviate just a little bit because I know we're going to talk about uh, Chapter 11 in the book here in a minute. But I got a couple things. Number one. Uh, I've got a little word on the street I want to drop on the franchise world in case they Ooh. haven't heard it. Yeah, we yeah. Had a huge, we had a huge win in the U.S. Senate yesterday. Um, we, we have been trying to uh, not allow someone in to run the DOL who hates franchising, who actually wrote the book on uh -huh. all the problems with franchising, extrapolated and moved to a bigger level than it actually is. Uh, David Wheel got voted down yesterday, so I am hoping we never have to deal with that uh, that thing again. So we're all doing a mini celebration today. I think franchisees, franchisors, suppliers, uh, frankly, the whole world should be because it would have directly impacted all of the local franchise units had he been able to do the things that he was setting out to do in Washington, D.C. So uh, well, that's can't... that's huge. You can't see me, but I'm raising my coffee cup to that right now. Well, the fun thing is I can see you, but you can't, uh, maybe, no, we don't see you on the screen, but I can see you. Yeah, it's this ninja thing, and it and it's all because I had to go to my dungeon. It's all good. <laughs> I've been sequestered so, to the dungeon. So let's talk about chapter 11 in the book, Kristen. Yeah, um, how to avoid it, right? Yeah, so it's chapter 11, and the title is chapter 11 and how to avoid it so you know, a little play on words there yeah yeah you know but but i want to tell you and i mentioned this to karen when we first got started today the reason i wrote the book is chapter 11 because i saw far too many people as i was consulting and coaching franchisees across the across the states i saw far too many people get in trouble and some of them actually ended up having to take chapter 11 in order to stop the pain, to stop the yeah. bleeding. Right. And so I wanted to have less of those problems in the world. I wanted to help franchisees make better decisions about the franchise system they choose. I wanted them to uh, consider the risk that went with that. I wanted them to come out of that with the best fit, with the best opportunity for success. And mm -hmm. so avoiding chapter 11 is literally the reason I wrote the book, because I want to keep other people from going there. And yeah. then uh, as I was writing the book, I ran into uh, one of the top franchise attorneys in the United States based out of Minneapolis. He's a good friend of mine named Ron Gardner. Uh, we've yeah. become friends through this process. And he's got an amazing story. I won't go into it today, but, you know, like a lot of us, he started out. Uh, not doing very well in the world and and uh, ended up being a top franchise attorney. And he literally lived for As you the little guy. We're losing Jerry. Yeah. As you can tell, Jerry's in his car. So as he garbles out a little bit, yeah. please forgive him. He 
Doesn't matter where he is, he's trying to get his message across this one. Bought a system that doesn't support them. Or Jerry, he's going to be so angry. <laughs> I want to say, is it Verizon? Is it T-Mobile? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? There, there you go. We can hear can you, you hear now, me? Jerry. Well, to the world that's listening, I want, I want to apologize, but I'm out helping franchisees stay stuck in the middle of nowhere. So, yep, I know that's yes. what we were saying. But really, Ron Gardner comes from a really tough background, and he ended up changing the world. And he works. Well, we may have lost him again. Yep. <laughs> well, one thing we know is that all of this is well documented in Jerry's book. And I believe at some point in time, they're going to be working on an audible uh, book as well so that you can listen to the book. And I assure you that when they get that done, it will not have issues. And the one thing I can say on Jerry's behalf is that he is absolutely right. The reason that he has um, often some of these interruptions is that, is that he does service the whole state of Iowa and Nebraska. And of course, that means that he's out in the beautiful parts of the country that unfortunately do not have strong cell service. So um, please pick up a copy of Live It to Own It. He is referring to chapter 11, which is avoiding chapter 11, ironically and funny at the same time. Um, and Jerry will be, mm -hmm. be back with us again next week where we may just revisit chapter 11 where he and when he has a better signal. So with that, let's go on to our next piece of the show. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Um... As usual, we want to thank our sponsors, the Titus Center for Franchising and Franchise Show 247 for being a part of Pillars of Franchising. As we said before, Jerry and I are going down to uh, the Palm Beach Atlantic University to socialize and network and learn at the um, board meeting down there. Um, so we will give you an update after we get back about that. Also, our magazine comes out tomorrow with Ruth Agbaji on the cover from CodeWiz. So be sure, if you have not done it, please visit pillarsoffranchising.com and subscribe to the magazine and let us know if there's anything else uh, we can do for you. We have a whole menu of, of things you can select to tell us what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Up next, we have Karen uh, from Dale Carnegie. Hi, Karen. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Very good, very good. I was listening to Jerry, and I know it's so painful when you when you don't get a cell signal, right? Technology is a beautiful thing until it's oh, not. It is, honest. absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, I'm excited for your segment today because we are going to talk about pe things that people don't want to talk about, right? Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny because Jerry was talking about the Chapter 11, how do you avoid Chapter 11? And there are so many great nuggets in his book. And, and one of the things that we talk a lot about, it's that people side, right? It's the people side of the business. And, and there's so many things about the people side of the business that can truly, as we've said, could blow your business up and can actually lead to chapter 11. So, so you have a couple of things I think that we're going to go over. And some of them we've talked a lot about before, and some of them we haven't touched on as deeply. So we're going to skim through the first couple and then get to the meat of the conversation for today. So what are the first couple of points that we tend to talk about a lot? The, the ones we talk about a lot are things like making sure that you share the same vision making mm -hmm. sure that you share the same values, you understand, you know, what kind of culture you want to build, you know, taking care of your employees. Those are some things that people talk a lot about. Um, even making sure you've got your business plan, that you know your exit, you know, that you have an exit plan, and even thinking about expansion, so making sure you're on the same page there. I think well, and as Ray likes to say, beginning with the end in mind. Or, yes, uh, it is that. so true, right? And sometimes even beginning with the end in mind, you'll talk about exit, but mm -hmm. I know in my case, some some of the uh, franchisees I would work with, they they wouldn't they would didn't talk about expansion. You know, where one really wanted to expand and, and buy more, while while the other partner did not did not want to do that. And so then you really had um, you, there was a lot of conflict within within the partnership as well because they weren't on the same page. Yeah. So, so that things that, that people don't think about us into the the first thing that people don't want to talk about that they need to talk about more. So what is that? 
Well, you know, it's called, how about plan B? Yeah. So if you think about plan B, you, you know, it's like when you get married, you know, you're always, you're always so happy. It's this new. So you're saying we should have another one lined up on the side. <laughs> <laughs> not that maybe, <laughs> maybe not that, maybe not that plan B, but you know, so many times we're so it's all rosy and we're so happy with our partners. And, and so we don't really want to have those hard conversations, those plan B conversations. And some of that plan B it's things like, um, what happens if somebody dies? You know, what's going to happen there? What happens if someone gets really sick? This happened with one of the franchisees I was working with, where one of the partners became very, very ill and couldn't work. Luckily, they had built into their agreement, their contract, what would happen, even the payments, how it would work. Um, all those things are really important that I think a lot of people don't, they don't want to think about. They don't even want to bring up because it's those, it's those hard conversations that can be somewhat of a downer. Yet, if you don't deal with those early on, when you start going through the partnership, they're even harder to have. Well, absolutely. And I think Jerry's going through some of that right now with his franchisee who passed away. And now it, it may have to be probated and going through all these things that, that were not planned for. Um, so that's a topic that I think is on the top of a lot of our minds, watching him struggle with this widow who's got to make all of these decisions now. Um, so I think it, in, it includes talking with your family and how that's going to happen. But with the partnership, you know, if, if one does pass, what is going to happen with that? Who's going to speak for that person? Um, how, how is that going to be navigated and how are those conversations? So Karen, how do you bring up those hard things? Because nobody wants to think about the bad stuff happening. We always want to try to put a positive spin on everything, but that is not going to help us when you have to get down to brass tacks. You know, what I found really works is, is just basically saying, okay, let's have a conversation about how we're going to communicate. I think that's, you know, mm -hmm. That's how you really start it. Uh, and, and to talk about those, okay, how are we going to handle these hard conversations? <laughs> and almost having a list, bringing to the meeting, you know, at the beginning to say, let's, let's have a hard conversations, uh, a communication or conversation. And so how are we going to communicate? Um, and one of the things that I always talk to people about is we're all different. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times, like I might want to hear bad news a certain way, uh, different from how you want to hear bad news. So even saying, you know, Elizabeth, if you disagree with me, you know, how, how, or, you know, how, how should we handle that? How do you handle that? How do I want to receive information? I think it's really good to have those conversations. So then if you know that ahead of time, when you do have to approach someone uh, about a difficult conversation, then you're like, okay, you had mentioned to me, you know, this is how you'd like for me to have this conversation with you. So right. this person can't get so, so ticked off. And I think a lot of times when you have that, those ground rules, in place, uh, that really helps a lot. Well, and don't you think that that agreement ahead of time or that plan brings accountability to the conversation? Because if I tell you, this is how I would like to receive the information and then I explode about it, then that's really on me. Or if you come to me in a way that I had specifically said puts me off or you know makes me defensive and you don't do that. So there's an accountability in how you communicate and you're both holding each other to it. So hopefully Absolutely. that's going to make for a more successful communication, don't you think? Oh, totally. And, yeah. Yeah, and I had I had a couple of business, business partners that I was working with, and they kept, you always say they want to kick the can. So they kept not wanting to have these conversations about how they were going to be dealing with some, some really difficult, um, difficult decisions early on. And, and I told them both, this is how this really sets the tone with even how you communicate on an ongoing basis. So this isn't even at, at first. This is really how your relationship, your partnership is going to evolve. And I think those beginning, the beginning days, the beginning times can actually set that into, into place as well. Yeah, because there are a lot of unknowns as you go through business ownership and you may think you're aligned with somebody and maybe you're not as aligned as you thought you were. That's happened to me. Um, and then what do you do? And, and one of the things we talked about before this, the call is, is uh, what happens if somebody wants out? I mean, nobody plans that. But things come up in life or things come up in business or you realize that you're not on the same path and you don't want the same things. And so what are you going to do? So you're saying that conversation needs to happen early on. Absolutely. And see, how are we going to handle this? Yeah. And what, what happens if we, you know, again, I was in a partnership one time where I had two, two other partners where one wanted to go one way, one wanted to go the other. They agreed at the beginning on where they wanted to go, but things happen, things change. So luckily they had had some, some communication early on about, okay, if this ever happens, this is how we're going to deal with it. You know, mm -hmm. their point was they actually got a mediator. They had a mediator work with them. 
And so again, I think it's those things about how are we going to deal with things? How are we going to handle the hard stuff? Yeah. And you know, a mediator is great. I, I'm in favor of those kinds of things. That is an expensive thing to, to have to go through. So if you can plan these things from the beginning and have agreements on how you go through the stages and go through the different possibilities, you may even be able to avoid that situation. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, Karen, is that, does that cover everything we needed to cover today? You know, the only, the only, the last thing it's, it's communicate, communicate, communicate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and I think that's a real, a real key. It's not just communicating at the beginning. It's, it's all the way through. And I think so many times, and I, I know I've been guilty of this in, in a lot of the different businesses that I've had, franchises I've been in, is that we get so busy working in, and I know it's just an overused phrase of working, you know, working on the business versus working in the business. And we talk about it, but that's, what is it? Sometimes it's common sense, not common practice. So yeah. one of the things I'd also recommend early on is to set a kind of like a communication schedule where whether it's, it's monthly, whether it's quarterly, sitting down, having, you know, actually having an agenda, having an agenda about also some of these conversations, what's happening in the business and, and planning for that. I think that also can head off some underlying um, issues that could be happening. Yeah. It just I think it does going and then they boil up. Yeah. I mean, we had, um, when we were working remotely and I was managing a team of writers, um, I took them to lunch once a quarter because everything was remote and I really almost never had to see their faces. This was before we were all zooming. It was usually by email or a phone call, but having that face-to-face -face conversation with them once a quarter. And I could say, are you getting the feedback you need? Are you getting the instructions that you need? Do you understand what we're looking for when we say, Hey, I need you to write this piece or what is it that bothers you and what would make your life easier? You know, and it kind of, they had never had that before I did that with them and they appreciated it so much. They were all freelance. So they just felt like they were on the outskirts of life and they weren't really, they didn't really matter to the business. Um, so I think stuff like that too, if you, if Absolutely. they know, they were just so delighted to go to, to go to lunch. It was such a simple thing, but it mattered to the relationships that we were building. One of the things that we would always do is, is we would patience. Yeah. 